All right, thank you. Uh, Rust Creek, not Rustic Creek, Rust Creek is the name of the movie. Uh, and I'm going to start by showing you a trailer for it. I'll take you someplace safe. My wife used to say, everyone we meet's a chemical reaction. They change us and we change them. Inside. And if there's trouble, run. Stay the hell away from me. Whatever you're into, you're gonna have to answer for it. Ain't that the truth? Cause you can run for a long time. You can run. All right, so that's Russ Creek, and I'm Stu Pollard. Thanks again for having me. As Ben mentioned, we're gonna have some uh, some giveaways afterwards. One of those things is a Rust Creek Blu-ray for those of you who actually still watch stuff on physical media. Um, they also make great coasters. Uh, but we got quite a few of them. I got a nice deal with our, we actually got put out on Blu-ray, which in 2019 is a minor miracle for any film. Uh, but I'm a filmmaker, I'm a producer, I'm a bourbon enthusiast. Uh, I split my time between here. I have a house in the Highlands and Los Angeles, slightly different places. Uh, I have a small production company called Lunacy, um, and one of the things when uh, Ben sent me this theme, which we'll talk a lot about today, uh, I referenced our blog, which uh, people give these talks and they reference books or whatever. I've never written a book. I've done a lot of teaching uh, in my career, which we'll talk about, but I strongly encourage you to check it out because there's a lot of things that I found myself going back to and reading some of these posts on our blog to help me get through some useful information. I, at least I hope you'll find it useful today. Um, but thanks again to, to Ben Terry for having me, to Ben Solee for suggesting this months ago, to Aaron Jones for getting me up here. A lot of really, really amazing people have preceded me on this stage, and given what a incredible bastion of creativity I consider Louisville to be, uh, and I'm from here too, remember, um, it's a real honor to be here. So, lost. Uh, I think for most folks it probably connotates once you get the TV show and a few other kind of joke references away. It's hard not to consider it with a bit of a negative connotation, right? Because the literal definition is you don't know where you are. Uh, creative types, however, are encouraged to view this word with, and the state of being, if you will, through a slightly more optimistic prism. Uh, it's like a talisman of vibrancy and vitality, an experience that recharges us and sets us off for our next discovery. Um, we never should really feel lost as creatives, right? And we should never really feel alone. Uh, the uncertainty with, with what comes next, that's, that's a gift, right? And that all sounds amazing, doesn't it? But let's get real. Somebody telling you that you'll figure things out when you're off your game uh, doesn't always work. Somebody telling you that everything's okay when you feel like you've failed because you can't come up with your next big great idea doesn't make you feel better, and somebody telling you that you're not alone when you really feel that way doesn't always help. In fact, words like that sometimes can ring pretty hollow, uh, make us feel even more misunderstood, crawl deeper into our holes, and make us feel even more hopelessly lost. And trust me, I speak from experience. I can trot out an awful lot of accomplishments, many of which I'm very proud of, but there's days where I don't feel like I've accomplished that much at all. Um, I'm extremely grateful for all the amazing people for whom I've collaborated, and for all the, the friends and family who've supported and loved me over the years. Um, but make no mistake, there's been numerous low points, plenty of times where I've second-guessed myself, and more than one occasion where I didn't only, not only felt like I lost my way, but I'd lost my mind. For those people who know me the best, when they hear the name of our company, they think that it might apply to me a little too literally. And if you're wondering why film might put me in that direction specifically, I'll show you how somebody once presented the stages of production to me. Enthusiasm, chaos, panic, despair, persecution of the innocent, promotion of the competent. We had a lot of production people stand up when Ben asked for that, so maybe a few of you know what I'm talking about. So I'm not going to glamorize being lost today as some 
oasis of uncertainty where you get to lounge around until inspiration strikes. I actually think being lost kind of sucks. And don't get me wrong, you're more than welcome to spend all the time you want on the road less traveled and coloring outside the lines. But if for you, feeling lost means you're mired in a creative slump or you're stuck in a rut, you can't come up with your next great idea, if in other words, you're simply not where you want to be, then something's got to change. And change is not easy. Sometimes it happens because of external circumstances. I'll tell you a quick story. I have two stories for you this morning. In the summer of 88, uh, at the ripe old age of, what was I in 88? I guess I was 21. Uh, I just finished an internship with an advertising agency in Miami, Florida. And I was saying my goodbyes to all the people that had mentored me. And I was explaining to one gentleman in particular that I was going to wrap up the last week of my summer before my senior year of college by driving from Miami to Orlando to Washington to Louisville to St. Louis to Columbia, Missouri, back to, Louis back to St. Louis, back to Louisville, and back to DC. He looked at me like he thought I was crazy. Then he stopped and said, no, wait, you're 21. You think you're immortal. <laughs> I didn't think too much of that comment at the time. Four months later, Saturday, December 17, 1988, I was at Georgetown. I was one of the last people left on campus. I was finishing up some term papers uh, as part of finishing up that fall semester of my senior year. I was going to miss my family Christmas with my, uh, with my grandmother, my granny cat here, who was an amazing cook, by the way, an amazing woman, um, I was gonna, which was the next Sunday, the following day. I was going to take Monday and Tuesday, finish the papers, be a good student, do my work, take the uh, drive home to Louisville, be home in time for Christmas Eve and all that. But something happened. I got ahead of schedule. I finished those papers late Saturday night. Uh, professor's offices were, were open after hours uh, because the school was open during exams, so I slid the papers under the door. I got back home. It was like midnight. I was like, hmm, I can pack a quick bag. I can jump in the car. I can be in Louisville by 10 o'clock the next morning, grab a quick shower, and I can be to Grandma's in plenty of time to enjoy that amazing family reunion and her cooking. Um, turns out this was not a good idea for a couple of reasons, not the least of which it never dawned on me that I despite the number of times I'd done this drive uh, in the four years I'd been going back and forth from Louisville to Georgetown. Um, uh, I'd never done this drive at night. So a town like this, Grantsville, which is in the middle of eastern Maryland, which sits on top of the uh, eastern continental divide, looks like this at night. Actually, that's the closest I could find on Shutterstock to recreating my memory. Um, I realized about two hours into this drive, three hours into this drive, that I was in the middle of nowhere. I had not told anybody that I'd left. I didn't tell anybody to expect me. I didn't even know if I was on a road, and I was the only car that I found for miles. Friggin' brilliant, right? <laughs> uh, suffice it to say, that was the last time in my life I felt immortal. Put another way, that was the first time in my life I thought I might die. And you can imagine that from that point forward, um, I was pretty had a pretty different outlook on life. Things changed. Um, that change was sort of forced upon me by a bad choice. Not all change happens that way. Sometimes change has to come from within. And in the time I have left with you today, uh, my goal is to empower you to do just that, to give you some tools to get closer to where you want to be uh, the next time you feel lost, hopefully just in the metaphorical sense. That night in Maryland, I would have benefited from uh, probably been a lot less terrified had I had something called a GPS, hadn't been invented yet. Um, so what do we do in 2019 when we're in a similar spot creatively, when we're battling feelings of uncertainty, um, doubt, and confusion? How do we channel those feelings into something positive or maybe even dispel them altogether? Well, allow me to introduce you to something I'll call today the creative positioning system. It's a set of customizable tools, tips, and life hacks I'm going to give you today that hopefully will help you find your way home creatively the next time you feel lost. First thing is balance. Um, we live in a crazy uh, high-tech world where there's that old Chinese saying, uh, if you work a day, in your, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I had that saying on my wall for a really long time. And it's true to a certain extent. I get to make films for a living most days. Uh, and that's a lot of fun. It's also a tremendous amount of work. It's incredibly stressful. And it impacts the people who don't make films in my life. Um, so I have to be careful about balancing that. Another way to put balance is simply to take care of yourself. So there are a few quick ways you can do that that don't involve going to the gym or going on some crazy diet. 
Uh, one is to simply slow down. Uh, we can communicate at lightning speed these days. Doesn't mean you have to. One of my favorite blog posts on our, our blog is something called the three-day rule, which is uh, a great lesson to learn, especially for those people who uh, rely very heavily on sending emotionally charged emails and texts. Um, I also don't believe you should buy into the multitasking myth, which out in the tech world now is becoming wildly uh, uh, dispelled. Um, try doing fewer things, uh, slower and better. Maybe even do one thing at a time, get it done, celebrate that, and move on. The second thing is actually get up and move. Studies have been done that, that, that microbursts of activity, going for a five minute walk every hour is better than going for an hour walk every morning. And you probably, if you're like me, you're like, how do I find time to go for a walk for an hour? Um, set an alarm if you have to, but literally just get up and move, especially if you're married to a computer screen as a writer or a designer or something like that, or an editor. Um, third, get some sleep. Um, there was an amazing article on ESPN recently um, about how NBA players cite one of their number one health concerns is not physical injury, but sleep deprivation because of all the travel. I can see some yawns out there. Um, hopefully that's just not the content of the presentation. Uh, but the bottom line is, just like you can't do your best work when you're rushed, you can't do your best work if you're not fresh. So try to literally discipline yourself to get on a regular sleep schedule. It will mean sacrificing something else in your life. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Jen McGowan, uh, who I still say is the hardest working person I've ever met in independent film, the director of Rust Creek, she said, sleep is my jam. And she went to bed at the same time every night we shot. She was the first person on set and was super, super charged every morning. And, it's just, and, and how well she took care of herself is just one part of what makes her a great director. Um, I'm willing to bet that if you take nothing else away from this presentation, if you make a concerted effort to take two weeks out of your life and get more sleep, you will get out of whatever creative rut you might be in. Um, now, if you're not sleeping, let's look at some reasons for that. Hey, we ready to go? All right, cool. Yeah, all right. Let's rock and roll. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, I'm caffeine. <laughs> it's cool. I'm cool. We're cool. We're cool. What? I forget. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, the most widely consumed psychoactive drug uh, known to man in the world, worldwide. I'm bad. Just kidding. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm legal. I'm uh, unregulated. 90% of American adults consume me every friggin' day. Okay. <laughs> As my buddy Brandon Moynihan, uh, you might recognize him as the gentleman who turned into Captain Obvious. That's him without the beard and the uniform. Uh, so caffeine, um, it's literally everywhere. I've had four cups this morning, so there's a little bit of do as I say, not as I do going on up here. But look, if, you, if you're having trouble sleeping, think about the things that you're putting into your body. And that includes something that's going to be sacrilege here in bourbon country which is alcohol. There is this artistic cliche that like, if I have a drink or some other mind-altering substance, it, it will free me to think. It will lower my inhibitions and I'll cook up whatever great idea I have. Um, I'm not here to lecture you on what you shouldn't and shouldn't put in your body. I'm a bourbon enthusiast, I introduce myself that way. But keep in mind, booze is a depressant and a diuretic. So if you're stuck creatively, again, think about is it worth feeling uh, that much more hazy the next morning versus how you feel right now going into your evening. Uh, and the last one that's going to affect your, your sleep is blue light, these damn phones. The advice here is simple. Sleep in a different room than your phone. Buy an alarm clock uh, or go find the one that you threw away. Uh, and as, as long as we're on the subject of phones, let's remind it who's boss. Um, you can always put your phone down and turn it off, right? Not airplane mode, not sleep mode, not vibrate. Like, I wonder how many of you actually had the courage to do that before you came in here. If you didn't, I dare you. I dare you to turn off your phones. See what happens over the next 20 minutes if you survive. There will literally be text and emails waiting for you when you turn it back on. Four big upcharges to, uh, upsides, slip, slip there, to, uh, to unplugging. One is you'll live more in the moment. You'll pay more attention to what's going on around you. That might allow greater focus on whatever problem you're trying to solve greater potential for imagination, daydreaming, and creative thought. You'll activate all of your senses. Those poor senses, uh, uh, taste, touch, and smell, are woefully neglected when you spend all that time on your phone. Uh, it'll help you take a break from social media, which we all spend uh, too much time on. And uh, you'll engage more with, um, with humans, people. Um, so you might 
have a better conversation with that friend you haven't talked to in a while, or you might learn something about a coworker. You might even meet a stranger while you're in line at the coffee shop, God forbid. Um, so, and friends, real people, real human connections, I think is something that we're all sort of desperately short on right now. Um, and as creative people, we need each other. That's a big part of the mantra that, that we were introduced with. Um, so that's part one, balance. Second one, break free of your comfort zone. Let's get you out of whatever um, rut you're in by trying something different. And I will tell you a second story about being lost. This one's more of a psychological version of it. Um, in 2005, I had finished my second film as a writer-director. It was a film called Keep Your Distance, uh, shot here in Louisville. And going into this film, I had very lofty expectations because my prior film, Nice Guys Sleep Alone, had done pretty well. We'd sold it to companies that you'd heard of, like HBO, and companies that you hadn't heard of in the year 2000, like Netflix. So I was pretty cocky going into Keep Your Distance. I made a couple of, of significant mistakes on that film, not the least of which is I took for granted that all the things I did right on the first one would break right on the second one. Um, and it didn't work out that way. So uh, by the time Keep Your Distance was running its course, I knew full well that it wasn't going to make its money back. And one of the things we have to do as independent filmmakers is own that. So I had to go to one of my largest investors, a very prominent businessman here in Louisville, and basically tell him, tail between my legs, you're not going to get your money back. Well, that's too bad, he said. But you told me it was risky, so I invested appropriately. As far as I'm concerned, you did exactly what your plan promised you'd do. My wife and I actually really enjoyed the movie, by the way, so you should be proud of what you did. This was not what I was expecting to hear. Uh, so as long as he was kind of on a roll, I said, do you have any advice for me? Uh, he goes, well, did you learn anything from this experience? You spent like two and a half years making this film. Uh, and I was like, um, yeah, sure, how much time you got? I can talk to you all day about how much I learned. He said, go teach. Um, and that was life-changing advice. Um, so one thing I'll tell you in terms of getting out of your comfort zone, I don't know, that might be another stand-up uh, thing to add next time, is how many people have gone out and taught. Um, I think there's three huge um, upsides to teaching, and I'll, and I'll preface this by saying there's that nasty adage out there that those who can't do teach. And when this guy who was a Fortune 500 CEO tells me you should go teach, and oh, by the way, when I was starting this company, I was spending nights down at Junior Achievement teaching young people how to start a business, that was pretty inspiring. Three reasons to teach. One is you're going to develop a greater mastery over what you already know. Because uh, you're going to have to prepare lesson plans. You're going to have to explain it to people repeatedly. Uh, you're going to work with fellow faculty who may specialize in things different than you do. Uh, the second thing is you'll expand your network. One of the most fabulous things, and there's a few people in the room here who have lived this out with me, is when you teach in the creative fields, the people who are your students graduate and become your peers. Um, there's very little uh, that has to do with age uh, in terms of someone being able to be a great cinematographer, a great musician, a great writer. Um, uh, we see that every year, new talent breaking through that's very young. Uh, and the third thing is, is you may be reminded just how valuable you are. And I don't care how long you've been on the planet or how much or little you think you know, something about what you've acquired is valuable to someone. And it may be a keyboard shortcut or a cooking tip or simply reminding somebody smaller than you to look both ways before they cross the street. But uh, once you share that with somebody who's appreciative, that feels good. And feeling good puts us in a better position to create. A few of my wild and crazy students over the years. Um, the second thing I'd tell you to do is take a class. Uh, this past week in Los Angeles, there was a gigantic conference that Adobe put on called Adobe Max. Uh, the gentleman to the right is a pretty legendary Louisvillian in my mind. He's an illustrator and graphic designer named Bill Green. He does all the outwork, our artwork for Lebowski Fest. And he's a dear friend. Um, I bought him a pass to this conference because uh, he does a ton of logo work for us. <clears throat> and I saw him at it this night and I said, has it been worth it? And he's like, I learned more in this one hour class on Illustrator than I have in the last three years of working. He's like, I wish I went to this thing 10 years ago. Um, he's like, it's just a struggle for me to get out of the house. Right? I got kids, I work at home, and I'm, and I'm good at what I do. Um, and he went to three or four keynote lectures where he, he said, you know, one of the funniest thing, most rewarding things about hearing this badass designer speak is he didn't know what any of these tools in Illustrator were called either. Um, 
he just knows how to make the thing. He knows just how to drive the car. He didn't know what's under the hood. So, uh, so don't be afraid to take a class, and it doesn't have to be in something you specialize in like Adobe. You know, take a cooking class, anything to get the mind started. We're working on a, it was so great that you played She's Gone, which I know uh, for you is a song about loss. For me, it is a Yacht Rock song. <laughs> and we're actually hopefully working on a documentary about these guys. And by the way, one of the giveaways is tickets to their concert tomorrow night at the Mercury Ballroom. I've got some VIP passes. We'll talk about that at the end, about how you can sign up for those if you want them. They put on a hell of a show. That's part of the reason we're making a movie about them. But there's studies that show that the brain, the reason nostalgia is going crazy right now is because the brain uh, responds favorably to what it's comfortable with. And that's the you know, old songs that you know the words to and that are very well performed in the case of these guys. The brain, however, grows when it's challenged, when it experiences new things. Now, that can be as crazy as reacting in fear to something that scares you, uh, or it can be something as inspiring to literally learning new things. So exposing ourselves to new things helps us uh, activate parts of our brain. Literally, there's newer science to support this, and I'm not a science guy. Um, uh, so anyway, third thing I'll tell you is crowdfunding, right? There's probably plenty of creative people in here who've got their next big idea, they're ready to pitch. There was even a presenter up here who talked about, I think it was you, Ben, talked about options to equity financing, and certainly one of those is crowdfunding. But I'm going to turn your perceptions of crowdfunding on its ear a little bit and tell you that what you should do is not so much think about how you're going to finance or just, uh, 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 set up your own campaign, but rather canvas all these sites, and there's lots of them out there supporting non-creative causes too that are very worthwhile. Um, canvas uh, those sites and find some campaigns that inspire you and back them. Uh, that's right, I said spend some of your own money on other people's stuff. Now, hear me out on this. First off, there's zillions of campaigns and causes out there, so you'll find something that, that tickles your fancy, as it were. The second thing is the buy-in can literally be just a few dollars each on all of these, so we're not talking about something that's fiscally irresponsible. Third, and maybe most importantly, when you join a crowdfunding campaign, you join a community, right? You will get to observe how people are running these campaigns. Maybe some of them work, maybe some of them don't. Either way, if you ever want to run your own, you're going to cultivate a lot of valuable uh, knowledge by participating in that. Last thing I'll say is get your hands dirty. Don't let being a creative person be equated to sitting in front of a computer or typing on a tablet. Go out, plant a tree, hang a picture on a wall, um, channel your own inner Nick Offerman, who apparently is an incredibly talented woodworker, uh, but do something that's tactile, uh, that lets you breathe some fresh air and get you away from the screen. Uh, and if you don't want to teach and you don't want to do crowdfunding and you don't want to build something, take a few minutes over the next few days and just look somebody in the eye and ask them how they're doing. Maybe it's a barista, maybe it's uh, uh, somebody volunteering here, maybe it's somebody who holds an elevator for you. But you'll be surprised how good you feel when you extend courtesies to other people. And again, if this is about getting unlost, as it were, putting some good energy out in the world is a great way to do that. We're almost home. Part three, the final third of your creative positioning system is your plan for uncertainty. As I said, I'm not gonna glamorize uncertainty. Um, but it's absolutely real and must be acknowledged. And as creative people, our careers are far more susceptible to it than others. Um, so we can't avoid it. How do we plan for it? Well, uh, Daniel Hill, an actor from Louisville who's had a tremendous year. We met him working on Rust Creek a couple years ago. I think he's booked eight movies this year. Um, he never knows, as do most actors, when their next audition is going to come. But he has a regimen. He always knows when he gets pages from his, his agent, a casting or whatever, if they come at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, he knows he's going to be the most prepared actor in the room for that audition the next day. It becomes number one on his priority list. And he does not uh, uh, waver from that. When you're a director, you start your day every morning on set with a shot list. A shot list is simply a, a list of what you want and need to make the day. Um, but sooner or later, especially in independent film, and a lot of times in Louisville, you know, the reasons the, the studio's got built in Hollywood, it's, it's always good weather out there. Um, something will go wrong that'll throw your day off. Or maybe you'll just get some creative inspiration and want to do something a little bit different. So a shot list is a plan that allows you, it has everything you want on there and everything you need on there. Right? So if something goes off, you can sort of calibrate in the middle of the day and hopefully get home uh, in terms of what you need. Um, so in terms of, of how this this translates to things we can do to plan for uncertainty. The first thing I'll tell you is come up with some productive routines. 
Developing healthy creative habits will help you consistently produce. Uh, Julie Cameron, in her book, The Artist's Way, says you should just get up every morning and write three pages of stream of uh, consciousness, right? Just so you're generating uh, uh, something consistently, right? Using that muscle, right? Just putting something out. Any good writer out there knows that the key to writing is rewriting. So understand that, that, and you need to pick your time when you do this judiciously, and I don't need to tell you the mornings are a hell of a time to do it, right? That's when the fewest distractions exist. Um, set some goals. Uh, you can't hit what you don't aim at. Just be careful that these goals are passion infused. Um, we need to be pursuing something that we love. If you're not, if you're pursuing financial, if you're pursuing I want to live in a bigger house or I want to be more popular uh, or be more famous, all those goals are byproducts, hopefully, or can be byproducts of a goal you achieve doing something you love. Uh, if you pursue those solely, I've, I've found there's a lot of people in my life who've pursued them that uh, they end up being kind of empty doors once you get there. Um, on the subject of being happy, and on the subject of playlists, uh, I didn't know where to put this part into my presentation. So uh, for those of you who believe in the power of music to change your mood, I thought it'd be fun to crowdsource today and give you a place on our website where you can go and put down any songs that you think are your happy songs, or songs that you just think are awesome and get you out of your funk. Maybe it's a driving tune, whatever, uh, lunacyproductions.com backslash songs. We will send you the, I'll send Ben the list and he can distribute it to you later. Um, there's no segue here, I just know where to drop this in. Uh, <laughs> the last thing is cultivate your community. Um, your community is made up of where you spend your time and who you spend it with. And choose wisely. We accumulate things like fans and likes and subscribers like currency these days, but none of those really have any significant degree of depth. You only need a handful of people from which to base uh, a great found or to create a great foundation of your community on. Uh, and that might be a, a coach or mentor to hold you accountable, uh, a friend who can give you, or a colleague rather, who can give you great feedback on a piece of material, and a friend who will always be there for you when you need them. As to the where, um, I've been fortunate to live in places like New York and LA and DC, but Louisville's always been the place where I've been able to create. Um, whether it's working with great crews on Nice Guys Sleep Alone, Keep Your Distance, or Rust Creek. There's a number of Rust Creekers here today, by the way. Um, Kentucky's been an amazing place uh, to not just create, but also to bring the work back and share it with the people who helped us get it made. Um, so I, I wanted to show just a few clips from some of the films we've made here as part of we uh, as a wrap up as just sort of a thank you to the creative community here for all we've been able to accomplish good times in brooklyn at the brewery with my friends i like to try those seasonal blends mm -hmm. in the distance a subtle hum So there you have it. That is my attempt to not just provide talk, uh, tell you it's going to be okay, but to actually give you some actionable stuff to try to get you back on track when you're lost. Um, I'll offer you one more wrap-up tip here, and that's perspective. Um, because uh, I will stick to my initial position that being lost sucks. Uh, but it is a temporary condition. And uh, it's usually, almost always, followed by relief, euphoria, or calm that comes with breaking out of that slump and finding your way out. When you do, take some note of what happened to you when you were lost, how you changed, what you learned. That night I got lost in the snowstorm, I carried that story with me for years. That feeling of a young person instantaneously falling from invulnerability to, more, uh, to feeling very mortal, feeling like they might take their last breath, stuck with me for a long time, so long that, that in 2012 I pitched it to a writer named Julie Lipson, and that's the seed of what became Russ Creek. 
Um, I met Julie because I was teaching at USC, a place I would never have been if I hadn't got that great advice from that investor. So those are two times I was pretty damn lost in my life that somehow converged and helped conspire to make a movie, help create a production company, uh, and lead me to where I am today in front of you. So the next time you're lost, don't give up. It's a recurring but temporary condition that's part of the life we choose. And if things ever really get bad, now you've got your creative positioning system to help you find your way out. Um, if nothing else, I hope this helps at least a few of you take your next steps, uh, even if we're not sure exactly which direction they might be in. Thank you very much. So we're going to move into like a Q&A time. And the first question that I kind of want to kick off with you is how would someone even start doing a film or producing a film, or where do they even go to get started? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, a few different places. One is Dean Otto is around here somewhere. Come and see these movies that Dean is programming at the speed, like Parasite. It's, it's probably going to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. Um, second thing is I'm on the board of the Louisville Film Society. I strongly encourage you to check that out. We, we throw mixers all the time and get people together who, are ha who have common interests. I show those crew pictures from those three films uh, nice Guys, Sleep Alone, Keep Your Distance, and Rust Creek, those are the three that I had the biggest hand in, um, because it really does take a village to get these, these things made. So the biggest thing I tell you is, and part of the reason I wanted to come here, and, and I believe in what you're doing, is it's a community that gets films made. So you can't do it by yourself. And that starts with the, how you get the ideas developed, all the way to the money, all the way to the physical production, to test screening the, the, the thing for people. So just don't try to do it by yourself, is the biggest thing I'd say. Talk to people of, of similar mindsets. What questions do we have out in the audience? Micah, why don't you kick us off? My name, my name is Micah. I'm pretty, well, uh, I'm pretty uh, popular, a little well-known person, pretty famous myself. I know a lot of people <laughs> feel like I do. And I just want to know uh, about how you have done any film in Hollywood or whether all the stars here or what you you ever done anything like that in Hollywood or somewhere like in a big city like New York, a place like that? Can you explain to me about that? Sure. I think the question was, have I, have I worked outside of Kentucky on bigger films, like studio films? The answer is sort of yes and no. Um, certainly worked on plenty of films that haven't shot in Kentucky. Um, we've made plenty in L.A., we've shot a few in New York, have shot a few in other cities that, across the country. Have never made anything outside the country, uh, hope to someday. Um, and uh, have never worked in the studio system. Also hope to someday, but uh, we've come close a couple of times, but have not done that. And it, part of being an independent filmmaker is there's at least a, a little bit of stubborn blood in my veins, uh, which means you don't like waiting around. You like kind of making your own luck. And some days that's a good thing, some days maybe not. Are there any common mistakes that you see happen time and time again by young people getting into film? Uh, that would, I would answer the same que that question the same way I answered the teaching thing or the learning anything. Um, th that's, I mean, there's a zillion of them. Uh, I think the biggest thing is people get in too much of a hurry to start shooting. Like, are they shoot before they have all their money? Um, they, they don't prioritize sort of having all the pieces in place they need before they, they start. Uh, and I think they underestimate the importance of how a good piece of material is essential to telling, uh, making a good film. That's one of the biggest mistakes I made on my second feature is when I say I took certain things for granted, one of the biggest one was my first film was based on a bestseller. It wasn't a, a literal adaptation of that piece of material, but I went out the next time and tried to write my own thing. I don't think Keep Your Distance is a bad film by any stretch of the imagination, but if I had to do it over, I probably would have started with a piece of source material and adapt it again. Other questions? Hey, Stu. Um, I've been thinking a lot this week about uh, what Marty Scorsese wrote uh, in the New York Times. I don't know if you saw that and sort of that conversation. And I know a lot of younger people are really prone to uh, kind of engage with the film industry through Netflix and streaming things. And I'm interested in your opinion as an, indiv as an independent filmmaker on what us younger people and people who may not be as familiar with the traditional film industry can do to promote independent film and just the greater cinema as a whole. Look, I think for, for young filmmakers, it's, it's great to aspire to get your work seen on a big screen. Rust Creek was released in 23 markets. That's the most any of my work's ever been released in. That's a little bit of marketing, 
and a great job of it on the part of our distributor because we didn't play multiple uh, multiplexes in each of those markets. We played on, on, and you know, you know, we played the Village here for three weeks. That was that was one of our most successful markets. Um, the the reason that the that the distributors put theater put movies in theaters these days is to get reviews, and also to drive performance on the online platforms. That's where all the money is now. So I think that the the idea is, at the end of the day, if you're a storyteller, you want as many people as possible to see your story. And I think we're at an age now where it's like, it really needs to be by any means necessary. There's, there's nothing like watching a comedy or a scary movie with a crowd, right? That's, that's what gets lost in all this. And so hopefully, you know, a big part of your generation, like, it's sort of why I say, it's like, I bring movies back here because people come and see them. It's like, that's a big part of what completes the circle for me. So I think if you all can be committed to going to see movies in theaters, like here at The Speed, it's like, as long as the screens are there, there'll always be a chance for great work to shine through and get seen on the big screen. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's a stab at it. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah. Hi. So many people, whenever they come to their creative ideas or thoughts they want to share, they get lost on how they should be able to do it. And one of the best ways is to express it through films or photography and all that. So I was curious. What made you get into the whole industry? What, what's your name? Anthony. Anthony, Anthony that's, you all ask me questions that are like, you're gonna get way too long answers. And I, the, the, the clock stopped, I, I kept looking at this presentation, it was the time of day, not how long the pres presentation had gone. So I was like, I lost all sense. I got lost up here presenting. I hope, <laughs> I hope it didn't go on too long. Um, the, uh, the random thing is, Anthony, I got, I got into it with, for no reason visually. I got into it via radio. Like, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in my room as a kid by myself. Um, both my parents uh, worked and were split up at the time, and I wasn't good at sports. So I, and I this, was, this was in the 80s, so I didn't have a video camera yet. I, I aspired to get one. But, um, but that's when I started creating. So I made a lot of sound effects just with my voice and was daisy chaining tape recorders together just to make stuff. And my high school class became my first audience. And that was the first time that I made something that I got a positive response to. They said, oh, you should try making more of this. So that's how it started. In terms of the visual presentation, it, it didn't really click for me until I got uh, to film school many years later. And, and one of the quickest things I learned at film school was, and this gets back to the collaborative nature of it, is like, I know what I'm good at, and I saw what some people could do visually, and I'm like, holy cow. I need to partner with those persons because there's no way I can ever make a camera make something look as good as that person just did, right? So, again, I don't know if that's that does a great job of answering your question, but but I think a lot of it is is kind of follow your heart, create what speaks to you, and if you feel like you're you're you need an assist in some area, partner with somebody who's who's strong where you're weak, and that'll make your presentation stronger. If you're a strong visual person, we were talking before the thing started, like sound is is there's. Um, Dean's gone, but hey, Derek, when is um, Midge's movie showing? Uh, November 27th. Is Making Waves? So there's an amazing documentary that will get nominated for an Oscar made by a USC professor called Making Waves. It's all about sound design and film. And it is an un unappreciated, unloved aspect of filmmaking. And this movie will make you cry. It is so well done and so appreciative of how good sound. You, it's like a, a shot being out of focus. You, you get irritated when shots are out of focus. Um, you also get irritated when there's bad sound. Like when there's good sound, you, you tend to not appreciate it as much. But it's so important. Um, and it's, it's a, so if you find a good sound person, if you're very talented visually, that'd be another way to, I'd say, to greatly enhance your visual presentations. One more question. Hi, I know we met this morning. Um, my mentor is working with some LiDAR technology, and so to bounce off of what you were talking about visually, I was curious to see what you think about LiDAR and VR in the future of movie making. I know that for Kentucky Karst Conservancy, they've used LiDAR to um, map caves, and that you can actually go through, because I'm afraid of going into the caves. So what do you see about um, that kind of technology in the future of movie making? You mean like augmented reality and, and virtual reality and all that kind of stuff? Look, it's here. Um, it's not my area of expertise. So I, all I can tell you is it's not going to go away. There's too many people who've got too much invested in it. And there were a few people. I did not go personally, so this is secondhand. But there were a few people who went to this 
con this is this Adobe conference and started experiment like saw some demos of what's coming in terms of augmented reality. It's not just going to stop at our entertainment experience. Like, there's literally there's going to be glasses you can wear that like will turn your picturesque backyard into like your Netflix queue. And so that's again, I don't mean to deflect the question. You might want to let one more get asked because I don't feel like I'm I'm totally qualified to speak on that. Other than the fact that it's coming and and. There were more presenters at this conference on the trade show floor. I had no idea what they did, right? It's just there's just so much work getting done in the gaming space and the VR space and the AR space. It's intense. I'll uh, ask I think you the, one and more. I, and I think the potential is probably limitless. Uh, somebody's probably in this room saying, I'm sleeping well, I'm moving, I'm teaching, I'm ready to make a film. Pull the curtain back and tell us, if I was going to do a short film, 15 minutes, what budget should I be raising? If I'm going to do a feature film, how much should I be raising for a feature film? Like just a rough, rough estimate. Uh, impossible question to answer, having not seen the script. But the the easy way to answer that is to simply say, on the on the short film, you're probably not going to make that money back, regardless of what happens. So you should just spend whatever think you think you can responsibly raise. Crowdfunding is great for that because it is transactional by nature. You have to to give whoever's contributing to your campaigns usually something tangible in return. For what you raise, but just be responsible. Uh, don't overspend. I'd say the same thing is scalable on the independent film level, with the exception that if you can, you know, create elements uh, of the the package that's going to go out and potentially finance the picture that allow you to, to operate at a larger budget, then by all means uh, you you can raise that money. But it's extremely, extremely difficult to to get a return on investment when it comes to independent films. Um, so part of the way you know we've been successful at it uh, is to is to make sure it's just what that guy said when I met with him 15 years ago. You know, look, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. So if anybody out here is considering an independent film investment, it's like invest at a level where you're doing it not as philanthropy. Hold hold the filmmakers' feet to the fire like you would any startup investment. Uh, make sure they they have a plan for how they're going to monetize the product uh, when it's done. But but don't. Uh, don't put in thinking it's going to be, you know, all wine and roses, as they say. Well, thanks so much, Stu. This was super helpful. Give it up right. for Stu. Thank you. Hope it was useful.